no matter what you're doing, no matter how far out it is or um, how sophisticated, how complicated it is, because a lot of modern jazz is like super complicated, you know, um, there needs to be this aspect to the music that you're making that connects to a, a universal human experience, you know, something that um, you can relate to, even if you don't know what the hell is going on, you know, because if, if you lose, if your music loses that, then it becomes a little, you know, academic or like not as meaningful. So even when you're making these turns that are surprising, there needs to be this sense of telling a human story, you know, and that's, you know, something that I, I try to keep in my concept. Welcome to episode 113 of the Bay Shed podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. What's up, folks? What's up, folks? On the podcast is Marty Eisenberg. Marty Eisenberg is a uh, he's kind of a staple on the New York scene. He works as a jazz bass player. He works uh, on Broadway. He works in classical uh, groups, I guess is the way to say that. But he's here. He's here on the podcast talking about his latest record called The Way I Feel Inside. Now, I got hip to Marty because his PR team uh, reached out to me and told me about the record. And before I had checked it out, before I had listened to the record, just understanding and uh, reading about the record uh, in the PR release, the EPK, um, I was automatically fascinated because this music is inspired by Wes Anderson films, right? So I'm already I'm already intrigued because this is this is a fresh this is a fresh approach to composition and creating a collection of music to release as a record. Um, so then I checked out the record. I really dug the record, uh, and it took some turns that I did not anticipate, which made me love it even more. Uh, again, the name of that record is called "The Way I Feel Inside." Uh, here here are some words from Marty about the album. There's something beautiful about creating a collage of sounds that aren't supposed to fit together, and yet they form a complex picture of a life with contradictions. It's that unconventional juxtaposition that drew me, that drew me to this project and inspired me to explore this music through a new genre, jazz. A mixtape is a personal, intimate reflection of what we want to show others about ourselves, and this album is my own spin on that concept. A journey into my inner life through this collage of meaningful music in my own voice as a composer and a jazz musician it's an album inspired by the songs and media that expressed how I feel in my younger years excuse me how I felt in my younger years but it is not a replica a replication of that media it's a series of diary entries a statement about identity and culture and an exploration of genre and style yeah bring it marty bring it it's beautiful i love that um so we do me and marty definitely talk about uh his new album and we you know talk about his backstory a little as well uh and explore some ideas about all of it on saturday august 26th the sixth annual kahuna concert for a cause will be held in san clemente california Kahuna Cares Foundation hosts a variety of events and campaigns to raise funds for the special needs community. Kahuna Cares supports Surfers Healing, which is the original surf camp for children with autism. Kahuna Cares also supports the Bay Shed Academy. Beginning later this year, I'll be presenting music appreciation classes with an emphasis on the bass for those with special needs. Uh, We'll be listening through music and, you know, kind of picking out the bass and bass lines. I'll have some basses with me that the class can learn about and, and hold and maybe generate some sounds on. I'm excited to engage with the special needs community through music, and I'm very thankful for the support of Kahuna Cares Foundation. For more information about the 6th annual Kahuna Cares Concert for a Cause, stop by kahunacares.org. You can also stop by the bayshedacademy.org. If you would like to donate to the programs for those with special needs, you can email me directly at ryan at thebayshed.com or email me through the Bayshed Academy website. All right, also in San Clemente, 
is lemurmusic.com. Everything you need for the double bass, stop by lemurmusic.com. Check out their uh, inventory on basses, bows, rosins, accessories. Man, ah, ah, this is like my fourth take doing this lemur ad. I keep saying accessory. Like, there's not even a word. Accessory. Accessory. <laughs> it feels really funny to say. Like, just the, the shape. Accessory. <laughs> Accessory. <laughs> Accessories. Accessories. I gotta practice saying that. Just accessories. Bows. Bows. Bows, bases, rosin, accessories. Bows, bases, rosin, accessories. Yeah, I'm leaving it in. I'm leaving it in. No edits on that one. LemurMusic.com. Use the promo code THEBASESHED for 10% off. All right, as I mentioned, uh, Marty Eisenberg is my guest on this episode. And uh, it was a wonderful time. Wonderful time talking with Marty. And uh, again, his album is titled The Way I Feel Inside. Check it out. I will have links up to it uh, at TheBayShed.com. Backslash podcast, you you can find it there, uh, and also probably like wherever, whatever platform you are listening to this on, there's probably going to be links below uh, in the description there. So check it out, check out Marty Eisenberg's new album, and here it is. Here's my talk with New York double bassist Marty Eisenberg. Hey Ryan. Hey man, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is it Martin or Marty? Which one is... I go uh, by Marty. You go by... Yeah. Okay. You prefer that? Yeah, I should change that. I do, yeah, yeah. Okay. Martin's too too formal. <laughs> I always wonder, like, with people that have nickname options, at what point do you decide to make the switch? For, for me, it was like kindergarten, you know? Like, I wanted everybody to know that I was cool, you know? I <laughs> so you gotta be square. Marty. You gotta be Marty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Like my mom, my mom's her, her name's Elizabeth, and she hated Liz, yeah. and yeah. so she's so me, my brother, and my sister all have names that like are not nicknameable. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I met a, a a Martin the other day, and there's not a whole lot of people with this name, you know, right. nowadays. And um, he told me <clears throat> I asked him like, "Do you prefer like? Did you ever think about calling yourself Marty?" And he said, no, because I didn't want uh, to people to like think of the like movie Back to the Future. It's and not I a was bad like, movie. there's worse whenever movies. I, whenever I, you know, like have to order a coffee or something like that, I always say Marty, like Marty McFly. You know? Yeah, okay. But That's for some reference. reason, he had the, the opposite reaction to it. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. Man, uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for being on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's. We're definitely going to talk about your record, but let's talk a little bit about your backstory first. Um, sure. Is bass your first instrument? So I guess uh, I I played a little piano when I was uh, you know in elementary school. Uh, I took lessons, and then my very and then when when I started band, you know my first instrument was trombone. Okay. Uh, and we had one of those instrument fairs where the band director played all the instruments for us. And, and I picked trombone because it looked the most like a banana, you know. Um, <laughs> as you do. You want, you want you, the instrument to resemble produce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> when I was about uh, 10, uh, my father got diagnosed with cancer and uh, he ended up dying from it. Oh, wow. Um, and he played a lot of instruments around the house. He used to play mandolin for us and bass guitar and all these things. Um, and so during the time when I was sort of, you know, processing all that, I took the bass guitar off the wall and I started, you know, learning songs. Um, and it was like, you know, first of all, I just loved the sound of the bass, the, you know, being a part of a band, you know, being in the role of sort of supporting other people, but it, it, it it's always been a connection to my dad, you know, being okay. able to, to do that. Yeah. That's cool. Was he primarily a bass player? No, he was a professor of Russian literature, <laughs> but you know, he played in bands and stuff when he okay. was young and okay. he just, he always, it was his hobby, one of his hobbies. Okay. So you're Russian then at least parts. Uh, yeah, several okay. generations removed. Yeah. Okay. What else? What else? Uh, ethnicity wise. Russian on my dad's side, Lithuanian on my mom's side, but 
you know, we've been, you know, and Jewish, uh, but yeah. uh, we've been, you know, for several generations American. Okay. Cool. Uh, have you ever been to either place, Russia or Lithuania? I haven't. And I, I always used to want to go to Russia. I'm not so sure anymore. But maybe someday. <laughs> maybe, maybe pause on that for a little while. Yeah. 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 Russia. There's a there's a rumor in my family that my dad worked for the CIA, but it's it's unconfirmed. Really, really? Yeah, because he was you know he was a professor of Russian literature and he made a lot of trips to Russia and uh, you know so he was the perfect sort of cover you know mm. for you know right. that type of thing. Right, right. No one's gonna he, look he never, at no one's gonna look know. at a professor. Right. Wow. Uh, so what age what age was that? About you know like. A, a, a middle school age, you know, okay. 11 or 12. Um, you know, I, I, I started taking lessons when I was in eighth grade with, okay. a, with a real teacher. Okay. Uh, what kind of music were you checking out then? At that time, um, I was really into sort of, man, like rock and like goth music and like 80s stuff like Joy Division and Sisters of Mercy and Bauhaus and um you know more deft tones like uh some of the 90s rock um yeah, yeah. but like you know i i i had i had very sort of artsy friends and we used to like go to record stores and like thumb through lots of records and you know i i love that sort of exploring something different and like finding something that was rare that other people didn't know about or that you know my other 13 year old uh, right, right, right. Friends didn't know about, and um, you know, so that led me down a lot of interesting sort of paths pretty quickly. Okay, okay. Your album is very diverse, I'd say. It's, it's jazz influenced, absolutely. Uh, when did you begin studying jazz? I mean, it was just sort of the a little bit the nature of the education system that I had, you know, it's like I'm playing rock and roll with my friends, but I'm trying to get better at the bass and learn as much as I can. And school has a, a jazz program. You right, know? So, right. so I start learning how to play jazz to be in the band. Um, but as I got better at the instrument, I, you know, jazz really felt like a place that was home for me just to be able to, uh, improvise with other people and sort of express my way myself in, in this abstract way where I could release some feelings without necessarily, you know, naming those feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and people could kind of just share that energy and have this sort of cathartic experience. And also just the, the joy of, of studying and, and challenging myself with other people, you know, that is what I love about jazz. Yeah. Did you uh, pursue a higher education within jazz or the bass? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I did my undergrad at the New School for Jazz Contemporary Music. Then I got out of school for a while. I tried to make it. Didn't work out so well. So I went <laughs> back to school and I got a master's degree at NYU. And then I was, you know, for about 10 or however many years I was gigging around town, you know, I've done Broadway shows and I was sub at Radio City Christmas Spectacular and toured and all these things. And then the pandemic hit and it was a little bit of a, of a restart. And so during that time, I decided to go back to school, get one more degree. I, I'm doing a, a doctorate, doctoral studies at, uh, at Stony Brook University that I'm almost done with. What is that in performance? Knock that off my list. Yeah, it's in jazz performance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what yeah. age did you pick up the double bass? Um, definitely in high school, probably when I was 14 or 15. Okay. Okay. Uh, how'd that transition go? Did you find it pretty natural or (laughs) yeah, me going from electric to upright was the biggest, uh, frustration that is still going on in my life. Yeah. it's It's just nonstop. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But there's something about it that keeps me coming back. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's definitely the truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, first of all, the, the instruments you get to play with, you know, the, especially, you know, I, I we didn't even have like Shen basses or anything. I right. had this like rock with a string tied to it with the strings <laughs> this high off and they're like steel, you know, so yeah. learning, you know, but I, I, fortunately at that age, your, your body can, can handle it. Um, sure. So. You don't, 
you, you kind of don't know that that's not what it should be. Exactly. You you're know, like, you're just this like, is oh, hard. yeah, like, wow, but... those guys must be really good if they can play like that <laughs> on bases yeah. like this. Yeah, exactly. Let's dig into the record. The record is called The Way okay. I Feel Inside. Um, talk about the concept for this record. I think it's a really fascinating concept. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So this album is uh, it's called The Way I Feel Inside, which is named after the zombie song, The Way I Feel Inside, which we play on the record. And all the music that's selected for this album come from Wes Anderson films. So the full title of the album is The Way I Feel Inside, inspired by the films of Wes Anderson. Um, and I've been a, a fan of Wes Anderson's films for a really long time. I, I sort of came to them during my formative years in, in high school when I saw the Royal Tannenbaums and uh, the Life Aquatic. And um, I think that he, as the filmmaker, he has this very sort of uh, unique and specific aesthetic way that he makes his films and tells his stories. And I, I was particularly fascinated by, by the music that he uses in his films, that, like sort of you know, the Baroque pop of Velvet Underground and the sort of like devastating and poignant, you know, Nick Drake and Elliot Smith. And there's sort of this connect, like the kind of story that Wes Anderson is telling in his films and the stories that are in this, these song choices, there's, there's a connection there. There's a kind of uh, culture that emerges. And I've been reading this book uh, by Mark Spitzer called uh, Twee, The Gentle Revolution. And so Mark Spitzer uh, calls this kind of aesthetic that Wes Anderson has as like twee culture. And uh, it's sort of uh, an aesthetic that's based around a kind of like whimsicalness, a kind of like childlikeness, but always having this sort of close relationship to trauma and sort of adult um, issues, serious you know, issue. So it, it's not escapism in the sense that, you know, we're just doing something whims whimsical to have a couple hours break from this sort of, you know, human nightmare. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's a there's a relationship between like embracing that whimsicalness to transform that, um, you know, those those issues that people are dealing with. And um, I have the book. I pulled up the book right here. So now oh, cool. I was curious about the the term twee which is explained um it's a hybrid generation known as twee which is the baby boomers and 20 and 30 somethings correct yeah yeah I'll, I'll try to explain it as best as i can i i think that a lot of this book is just kind of him like uh digging on uh uh millennials and making fun of us but uh okay. there is a sort of go ahead no, no, that's fine. Like I'm right at the cusp of millennial. Where do you fall? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm 37, so okay. you know, el elder millennial, I guess. Yeah, yeah, same. So, um, I mean, sort of what like he does a history of of like artists he thinks of as as twee, and it it goes all the way back to sort of like Walt Disney as sort of a proto twee person who you know, fought in the war. Um, and you have this whole post-war culture of so much sort of uh, death and horrible things. And he creates this, you know, he creates modern cartoons, sort of, you know, this childlike storytelling that's also for adults as a response to the violence in the world. And, um, you know, as Twee, Twee sort of finds its sort of mecca in the early 2000s with artists like Wes Anderson, he sort of, talks about Zoe de Chanel and like uh, all these sort of like characters who are um, sort of misfits, but you know, to, to compare it to something like punk, you know, who are another sort of culture of like misfits, like mm -hmm. punk is all about like rebelling and, you know, letting out anger and all these sort of things. Uh, but all you sort of need to do to fit into a punk culture, not to, you know, this is Mark Spitzer's words, right. is to, uh, you know, get a cool haircut and buy a Sex Pistols record, right? <laughs> but sort of, I don't even know about a record, probably just a shirt. Like, I don't yeah, even know if you need yeah, the right. record. <laughs> yeah. But sort of like the Twee character is someone who like knows about literature and collects records and all this stuff, but it, it's not just because they're smart. It's because it's in a relationship to sort of 
not feeling included in society either because of like you know these people are just very shy or you know are dealing with some sort of trauma it's also usually related to high school type of uh Mm -hmm. you know youth culture um but sort of the 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 hero of these stories are 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 the interesting kind of gentle nerds who are uh you know trying to figure stuff out and and that's a, a character i relate to that's a that's an audience i i feel like will hopefully relate to to my story which i've tried to sort of you know i've taken this concept of wes anderson's aesthetic and i've used these songs but i don't really see them so much as cover songs as sort of like reinterpretations of this aesthetic um trying to tell my story and and so, some of the songs i've the songs i've selected are intended to do that. I, I can go into that in a little bit more detail later. Man, if you want. I, I looked up Mark Spitz too. He's he passed away. Oh, I didn't know that. He uh, he passed oh, away in 2017. Damn. So uh, I'll never hear my album. <laughs> <laughs> he was only 47. It's like, dude, you weren't yeah, even really old sucks. enough to be ranting about another generation yet. I know. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, he's got uh, he's got a couple of books out. Yeah, I mean he's a good writer. I I definitely enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So you you're coming at it from that approach. Yeah. Um. Now when I checked it out, it's obviously jazz influenced. It's kind of also. How do I want to put this to make sure I'm communicating it like I heard it? Theatrically charged. Yes. Okay. That is accurate. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime you talk about someone else's music, it's uh, you know, sure. It's walking on a Honestly, frozen it, lake. I get it. it. It's been really fun, you know, especially to see some of the first couple of reviews come in. And it's like, wow, the, you know, this writer like who knows nothing about me kind of gets it. Like, that's mm-hmm. awesome. That means, you know, I've communicated it well enough, I guess. How did you... Um... Now, conceptually, you just spoke of kind of like the artistic motivation that led you down some of those Mm -hmm. paths. Compositionally, how did you approach this? Because there's, on first listen, you know, when when your PR people gave me a copy of the record, um, I'm thinking like, okay, this sounds like an interesting jazz record. Track one happens, I'm like, all right. Is that harpsichord right out of the gate? Like, what am I hearing? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't expect that. I'm interested. I'm definitely interested. Uh, track two comes around. Um, it, it, that took another turn. So, how did you approach this as a composer or a sure. producer of the record? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, uh, I've been working in the music industry for about 17 years, give or take. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is the first record that I've put out. So even before I had the concept of making this sort of Wes Anderson album, I I wanted my first album to reflect my experiences in the industry to sort of, you know, these are all the kind of gigs I've had and these are all the things I've learned and this is all that I bring to the table. This is my experience. This is what I find interesting. And there's, you know, I I never thought when I got out of college that I would end up be working in, in musical theater or, you know, I spent about five years playing like traditional jazz, you know, the kind of like old school, uh, you know, Spang-a-lang. slap of the bass, yeah. spang yeah. Um But I learned something from all those experiences and I, and I found things that, you know, you know, from from the indie kid who was originally into like the most gothic shit to be doing <laughs> musical theater, you know, it's 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 a hard turn. But uh, it seems, there's things it seems I love. like they would be closely... Yeah, they have more similarities than differences. Honestly, that's the truth. It, yeah. It's just sort of the sort of. Um, bias but if you take against... away all the black nail polish, you're left with yeah. thespians. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's super accurate. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, yeah. So I wanted it to have all these different aspects of of my life and my personality, which is why it sort of it 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 moves around a lot. Um, one of my favorite composers is this guy named Gary McFarland, who was a composer in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is such an interesting composer because his music is just so full of these unexpected turns. And his first record 
was, which is not even my favorite record. I love his original music much better. But his first record was all music from, it was sort of his version of the Frank Lesser musical, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Okay. And, you know, this record is just so Gary McFarland. Like it's, he, he just, he just makes these like fascinating, like jazz charts out of all these tunes. And that was another part of the concept of what I wanted to do, you know, uh, is to really put my spin on this music and make lots of unexpected things happen. And uh, my arrangement of Rebel Rebel on the record is re- directly influenced by Gary McFarland, who did these these 60s records uh, when Bossa Nova was just starting called, the first one was called Soft Samba Strings. Yeah. And he, you know, buries the mel he does like beatles tunes in, in a boston of a style but he like buries the melody and writes these new melodies on top of it and then like instead of singing the lyrics he'll just go mm, yeah 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 type of yeah. thing it's so 60s it's so fun yeah and that's, so that's that's definitely the vibe uh of rebel yeah. rubber like it just like i didn't know the tune you know yeah uh, and so i'm like i uh, rebel rebel okay i'm i'm ex- Something with some angst, maybe. And then, yeah. no, it's just like this Nancy yeah. Sinatra vibe with vibraphones <laughs> happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was cool. It was cool. Thank you. There's not one set of instrumentation throughout the record. Like, each tune has its different... Is kind of instrumentated or orchestrated for the tune, which is cool. Uh, were these all recorded at the same session? Or were they kind of pieced together over a couple of years or something? We we did two dates at Bunker Studios okay. um, where we recorded all eight songs. I had kind of core band is like a seven piece band with a saxophone doubler, uh, trombone, our vocalist Sammy Stevens, uh, and then the rhythm section, drums, bass, guitar, and piano. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple songs where we don't have the horns on it, like uh, Needle in the Hay mm-hmm. and Cello Song. And there are a couple songs where we add instruments to that. Um, we did it all live in the studio, except for I overdubbed a few things, such as the harpsichord, um, uh, the, some, other, the, uh, some of the other instruments in The Way I Feel Inside. The introduction has like a French horn choir, and I just yeah. had one person overdub the French horn, some other stuff like that. Did the some studio guests. have a harpsichord? They didn't. They okay. didn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I actually, I, when I was, uh, I do a, I've done a gig of, for a few summers at uh, the Utah Opera and Musical Theater Festival where I fly out there for the summer and play oh, cool. like a rotation of musicals and operas. Um, and there was a really good harpsichord player there and they, the, the festival had their own recording people. So I was like, I could get this done right now. Like yeah. let's get in let's the room and record this harpsichord. So nice. that's what we did. Let's kill it. And that, uh, that's Dallas Heaton. Who's a fantastic harpsichordist. Oh, and then Dallas lives in Utah or Dallas is yes. in, cause you're, you're in New York, correct? Yes. I'm in Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, man, but a quick tangent. You play on Broadway. There's, I've been hearing over here just a bunch of people spouting off about the scene on Broadway right now. Yeah. I haven't really checked in with my Broadway friends too much about it. Some of them are just eternally dark on the whole thing. <laughs> so mm, I can't get yeah. a fair gauge on it all. Uh, what's the scene like over there in New York about the Broadway? Are you talking specifically about Here Lies Love? Uh, is that... Is That's that the, the sh- thing okay. I'm thinking of. Let me let me I'm, let me I'm give you about what's his name? What's his name? Bird basically sidestepping yeah. to use David pre-recorded Byrne. music. Yeah, yeah. So okay, here's the thing. There's been there's been a trend in uh, Broadway for smaller and smaller orchestras over the past years. Producers are trying to save some money. Sure. Uh, the union is trying to fight to keep those jobs there. Um, and. David Byrne has this new musical coming out called Here's Lies Love, which I believe is open now. Um, and uh, it's, it's I, I don't know the whole story, but it's, it's, it's something about uh, a dictator in the Philippines and the Philippines have this culture of karaoke that's really big over there. And so David Byrne, 
you know, conceptually wanted this, uh, the music to feel like a karaoke show. And that's sure. kind of how he pitched it. Now, to record the music for this show, he he hired 40 mi- musicians to like make the record for the show. Okay. But the concept to do it live was with zero musicians. Right. Or maybe one musician who's like, you know, programming everything. And um, the the theater that he's doing the show at has a contract with the union that the, the shows are required to have 19 musicians, which is a pretty large orchestra. Um, there's this thing called, I'm getting very technical here, no, but no, there's no. this thing called the special circumstances rule or whatever. And that's where producers can say, listen, our show just does not call for that many musicians. We want to make some sort of deal with the union. We'll contribute to your pension fund or something like that. And use okay. a small orchestra that's happened on a couple of occasions. Mama Mia was one of those shows. Uh, but basically David Byrne and his team were like, no, we, we want it. This is my concept. I want to do it with, you know, tracks. And then the musicians union, you know, uh, really fought hard and they got stories into the New York times, into these big newspapers that started to actually drum up some, uh, resistance to this thing in the, in the public and a, and a backlash. And what ended up happening after some uh, negotiations is that David Byrne and his team caved mm. and there are going to be 12 musicians on the show when it okay. opens. So okay. it's a big victory. It's it's a little bit of a loss too cuz we're we've cut from 19 to 12, but you sure. know, it's better than zero. So yeah, I mean it's it's a tough it's a tough environment for sure. Um but uh it's a, it's a beautiful community. It's a fun job and um you know Fighting the good fight, I guess. Yeah, I hadn't heard that uh, it had been flipped. This was probably around like maybe two weeks ago was when yeah, I very heard. Recent. Yeah, that I heard uh, about all the other stuff. And then like they weren't going to use anybody. And, you know, yeah. I think I think we all kind of feel that a little bit. Anytime the, the occupation yeah. gets even more threatened by anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it was just like so then even people over here that are don't even do musicals you know there's really one <laughs> there's pantages yeah. out here that's the only uh <laughs> real theater gig that's of note um yeah but even people that aren't doing pantages out here like everybody's up in arms and posting and oh good yeah they this. should be yeah and i think so but it's um it's funny it's, it's just funny yeah that what everybody's take on things is and uh, yeah I, i'm glad that the they opened it up to at least have some people in it. Yeah, I mean, part of me, artistically, feels like that's a bummer that his vision didn't get realized for his piece of work. I do think that sucks. I think that there is... I've heard some people with that take. I think that there... You know, I, I, a lot of people hear him say that and they're just like, you know, F this guy. Like, no, that's I just mean, bullshit I, excuse. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, I, I, I'd, I'd rather have musician spell. work. I, I take him at face value that this is what he believes is what's best for the show. The thing is, I think what's happening is bigger than that. And it's, it's more important yes. that like, if this were to happen, if he were able to create a Broadway show that has zero musicians, it's like, boom, the door's open for that. And that's what it's going to be. Right. And that's a nightmare, you know, yeah. so, and a runaway train. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. everybody's just going to see like, what, what are we paying? How much can we save? Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's going to snowball quickly. So yeah. although artistically, I think that about what he was intending to do, I, I it's more important to me that musicians yeah. uh, stay in the scene. We'll be back right after this. All right, folks. All right. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. I'm offering up the middle of the show, right? The middle of the episode. I'm offering it up to you. That's right. If you have a new single out, you have a new album out, if you would simply like to get heard by the bass community, if you give a shout out to your social media handles, you know, your, your Spotify page, whatever it may be, hit me up. Stop by thebayshed.com and get featured on the Bay Shed podcast. Excellent, sir. Uh, the record in total is seven tracks. Eight tracks. And eight tracks, really? <laughs> Did I Sorry. only get seven? <laughs> <laughs> what happened here? 
Huh, all right. Well, I mean, you would know better than me. I thought it was. Like... <laughs> what happened to the tab? I forgot what happened to the tab here with your. I had your stuff open. Anyways, all right. It's eight tracks. Um, the last track I have is cello song. What's the song after cello song? Uh yeah, you didn't get these days. No. Oops. Okay. Yeah, let me send it to you. I'll I'll drop it in the chat. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'll send you the music video. Oh, there's a music video. Yeah, that's the one we have a music video for. That was sweet. What pun did you know you wanted to write at a record or at least a collection of material based on Wes Anderson uh, films? Um, or some of these, think, you know, yeah. ideas? I mean, it started off a little bit of a, you know, like I've been writing music off and on all, all this time and every once in a while I'll come back to you know doing a cover of a song that I love and I, I certainly love like you know the stuff that Brad Meldow and the Bad Plus were doing in like the late 90s 2000s sure. where they're covering more indie artists you know I thought that was you know a very cool thing and and, and you know uh, so I, I wanted to do something like that as well. Um, and the first arrangement I did was this Stephanie Says arrangement by the Velvet Underground, minus the harpsichord and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I had put it up on the internet as a, as a little video. And I, you know, kind of put in the chat, at, you know, like, wouldn't it be kind of cool if I did something that was kind of like a, a Wes Anderson concept, like all music from Wes Anderson movies? And people were like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I was like, okay, this could be cool. And then I didn't really do anything with it for a while. Um, and, but once the pandemic hit and I suddenly had all this time, I started to really dig into, uh, you know, uh, exploring this music and, and really, you know, this could work. You know, this could be an album. And, and that's, that's sort of how it started. Okay. Are you, are you kind of like a movie buff? Are you, are you really into cinema? I... <sighs> I like movies. I've seen okay. a lot of movies. I have a lot of opinions about movies. <laughs> I I can't really call myself a movie buff, you know, but okay. uh, not in the same way that I'm a music buff. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. I have seen every Wes Anderson movie, though. I will say that. You know, I don't know. When I got when I got the info about this record, and apparently not all eight tracks. <laughs> uh, I have to talk to Chris about that. Yeah, yeah. Um I had to look them up. I'm like, because obviously I know of Wes Anderson by yeah. name, and everybody just talks about Wes Anderson films as Wes Anderson films. You know, like the mm -hmm. whole collection all the time, similar to like the Coen brothers. But yeah. I'm like, what What are they? <laughs> so I had to like yeah. Google, what are Wes Anderson films? Uh, I've seen, I think, maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, but not not a lot. And that being said, I'm not like a big movie guy at all. I watch a yeah. ton of true crime documentaries. That's all I. <laughs> that's just kind of my thing. Uh, yeah. But I've seen Rushmore and I saw Life Aquatic. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are those were hilarious. Yeah. Uh, so after I saw those, I'm like, okay, that's kind of the feel of the the thing. Now I get yeah. it. The the tune, the way I feel inside. I, I when I was listening to the record. This, this is uh, the first track, track two on the album, but the first mm -hmm. one in playlist order that has vocals on it. Yes. After the vocals, really long bass solo. Is the bass solo meant to make the narrative personal? Mm, that's a good question. It wasn't my in my conception to, to, to uh, you know do that necessarily but um it, the the song is a little bit of a long form yeah. um so when you play over it, it it's, it's a long solo but i mean honestly the answer is yes uh okay. because um i mean that that song is kind of the whole concept of of the record sure. um you know like uh in in a few ways i feel like um you know one of the things i've talked about is this concept of a mixtape um, you know, as, as a, as something personal that you, you know, like back in the day, you'd give a mixtape to someone sure. and that mixtape could be kind of a, a placeholder for how it feels to be you. I mean, in a way it's like this, these songs that I've chosen are me and, and I, I want you to understand what it feels like to be me, or I want you to understand how I feel about you. 
and uh, that's sort of the concept of naming the album the way I feel inside. But on a more personal level, like um, this song, um, when the zombies performed it, it's just like an unaccompanied vocal of, of the melody. It's very intimate and personal. And the lyrics are, um, you know, about this sort of unrequited love, like trying to hold in, you know, feelings and conceal the way you feel. Should I try to hide the way I feel inside? And I've always felt like it's a great metaphor for the queer experience because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I came out a little bit later in life. So I certainly have concealed a lot of feelings over time. Um, and that's why this track is is also very personal to me because okay. it's 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 something that i relate to is it uh, in a sense a uh, little bit of how do i say it, the the musical story of that process for you of maybe the absolutely. struggle and then the freedom of it yeah absolutely yeah i mean the, the the whole record is sort of you know like a wes anderson story it's whimsical but sort of processing my own traumas you know the, the the birth of my love of music was from my father and then you know dealing with this unresolved issues of identity um so you know you have songs like the way i feel inside you have um these days which is sort of uh, this reflection on regret and sort of my arrangement takes it to a little bit more of a major place a little bit more of a sense of acceptance um, the song So Long, I included for my ex-wife a little bit, sort of my feelings about that relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's my did, story. Did this, did doing this uh, album and kind of doing a deep dive emotionally on these, you know, on your story and really getting in touch with different parts of your past and your present and all that stuff, did, was it cathartic? Did it help you? process or heal or empower or what what's been the takeaways since doing this process for you on an emotional level <sighs> man that is that's a tough question because right now i'm still so in it you know with sort of the trying to get the story out and you know get the cd release party and book the gigs and like there's just so much anxiety i i don't feel like i'm able to process you know how i feel just yet but mm -hmm. um, and part part of that will come a little bit from the response of audiences and, and and critics and such, but that is that is certainly the goal and that is that is you know what I hope um, audiences will you know get to process how they feel about things as well and you know there definitely is a sense of um, of growth you know yeah. from this album I, I will say that yeah it's it's a big thing to do. You know, yeah. like I remember when I got done recording mine, it was like after the session, I was done with it because like I yeah. had, it was done, you know, oh, like it's so hard to listen to. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I can't stand listening to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, I'm going to run ads for it on this episode. Um, yeah. But after I tracked it, it was just like, OK, I'm done because now it's out of me. Like the music is out of mm -hmm. me now. It got realized. It got played. It was recorded. No one had heard it, but I was done with it. Yeah. And so it just sat on a hard drive for like nine months before I did anything right, yeah. to it. To like, yeah. It felt like a, a time warp to go back and revisit this, even though I yeah. had already, I'm on to the next then, one, you know? And, I'm like, well, and shit, then to be talking is... about it for six to nine months, yeah, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And for, for me, it's like, I mean, art is never sort of finished, right? Like, no, so no, no. I hear it now and I'm like, Oh, I could I could have changed this and that and also like you know when I started this project you know Wes Anderson was this thing from like my past who hadn't really emerged in the public's culture all that much and like recently I don't know if you've seen all these like TikTok videos of people like doing the Wes Anderson trend and then there's these AI videos of like what if Wes Anderson directed Star Wars so he's so like in the cultural zeitgeist right now and it's giving me all these ideas like if i made the album today it would already be different than mm -hmm. the one i made yeah, yeah, in yeah. september of 2022 sure but you gotta live with that too you know that's what it is yeah i mean i think they're all just polaroid pictures you know yeah. like that's that's yeah. what happened that day uh, you know and everything that was influencing you that day was a part of that and uh for better or worse you're stuck with it yeah you know yeah would you ever give him a copy would you ever 
We're we're trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. yeah. Where's he at? Yeah. Is he at? Is he in New York? I honestly don't know. I don't think so. I imagine he's on some sort of whimsical private island. <laughs> <laughs> Do you enjoy writing for larger groups? I do. You know, I, one thing I, as as a bass player that I've found kind of challenging is that, you know, when I play in kind of pickup jazz groups where we have like one rehearsal before a gig, you know, if you're the piano player, you know, you put a chart in front of the rhythm section with some, you know, some bass lines, some hits or whatever. I'm, we're good readers. We can like, you know all the hard stuff's in the piano, you know? Right. So we can just nail this on one rehearsal. As a bass player, to do a trio, you know, and I put something difficult in front of a guitar player or a piano player, it's like, we're either going to need a lot of rehearsals, which uh, can be difficult, or it's going to be a little, it might be a little sloppy on the gig, you know? So, like, being able to expand the ensemble, um, one is fun for me as a writer because I get to work with a lot of like counterpoint and stuff like that. But it also sort of spreads the responsibility around a little bit where I'm not just counting on one musician to handle all the melodies and carry the band. I mean, if I were a better bass player, I would be maybe doing all the melodies on the bass, but that's just not the way I write. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that can, you can run that into the ground pretty quick. Yeah, you know, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. When writing for instruments like French horn and stuff, did you have to learn a little bit about the instrument? Well, um, I uh, my degree from the new school was was composition. Like okay. I, I was a composition major. Um, and when I when I was in college, so this was a like I was one of five composition majors in, in the new school, and it was the last year that they had that program. Okay. So it was like all these like killing performers like there are some very famous people from my grade like galat hexelman jamire williams like tons of other people and what year were you, you know uh 2004 to 2008 okay i think i know some people that might have been there around that time i'm, I'm sure you do yeah. yeah um so anyway like i felt a little bit like you know uh a little bit you know a little bit like an outsider because everyone were these like I mean never a lot of people feel that way in college when you get into a good conservatory where suddenly you were the you were the best bass player in your little hometown and now you're in New York City and there's right, all right. these people that are um but I the thing I did to kind of like find my own thing is I put together this really big band I had a 13 piece band wow and I got these musicians to like show up every Sunday to the new school to rehearse my music. Even when I didn't have new music to rehearse, like we just rehearse every week. We had a set time okay. and it was like the most creative period of my life. I was like so happy. I was writing a lot. I was really sort of couldn't really play all, you know, as well as I can now, but I felt like as my voice, you know, if, if you heard, heard some of that music that you, I was writing then you could really hear the connection to the, this album but what ended up happening, you know, I got out of college and I thought I'm going to bring this band to the world, paying 13 musicians to play New York City venues is like, I'm losing a grand a show, you know, yeah. and I'm working at Lowe's. Sure. So, uh, you know, so that was a very devastating moment for me. That was a moment when I sort of decided, OK, I need to figure out how to have a career in music. Mm -hmm. And so for the past... 15, 17 years, you know, that's what I've done. I've, I've gotten gigs. I've gotten under the scene. I've honed my chops as a sideman. I've, I've, I've done theater and, you know, got my bow chops together and all this different stuff. But it, it, it you know, in the, in the pandemic, it's like, I, it, when all that sort of ended, like it made me realize like this thing that I'm missing, that's really what made me the most happy about making music is, is making my own music, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the hardest thing to do in the music business because you know it really is i mean it's it's also can be the most lucrative and successful if you hit it big you know obviously all the big stars play their own music they don't play you know uh top 40 or jazz standards sure. necessarily i mean sometimes they do jazz is a little different yeah um but yeah you know so this was this was kind of my you know this was my shot and you know i i put everything i could into it and you know and so was it a full history. was it a full reinventing of the career during the pandemic to really kind of put all your eggs in this basket and not necessarily give up on the the working sideman stuff but back burner that and go artist forward I mean 
kind of. I okay. mean, uh, it was it was certainly a, a break from from doing the other things. Now now I'm I'm doing them again. You know, yeah. I'm I'm playing around town with everybody that I can, and um, I hope to continue that. But I, as I also there are some gigs I would you know turn down now to make more space to do the you know creative stuff. Um, and you know, the, there is a whole process, you know, the booking gigs takes a, a lot of energy and then, you know, yeah. uh, promoting them and organizing music and rehearse. Like there's, there, there is a huge chunk of energy and effort you have to put into that. And that is difficult on top of everything else, but you do have to carve out time for it. Yeah. Yeah. Just the administrative stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot of rejection, yeah. a lot of no answers Oof, to boy. emails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. awful. It's awful. Yeah. Um, but you got a PR, you got a PR guy. How's that work? I do. Oh, Chris is the best. Honestly, okay. Chris DiGirolamo, if anyone ever needs a PR guy, you got to get this guy. He's like, as always made me feel like he's very invested in my project and cool. you know, we're in constant contact. Like he'll just send me like texts and messages to let me know what he's up to, what he did recently, what he's trying to pull for. And, you know, I, I just feel like I trust him and, and he's doing a great job. So sweet for, for a new artist, I feel very grateful. Uh, that's great. That's great. Have you seen some some traction? Have you uh, do you pay attention to your the numbers on that? I kind of geek out on analytic numbers. Yeah, I so well, the album's not out yet. The album comes out that's July true. 7th. OK, so, so this I, is all I have been able to see we're all in the pre-release phase. I know okay. that, you know, our our music video has about 3,000 views on YouTube right now, which oh, is a lot for me. That yeah. seems like, you know, uh, making progress there. Um, I have a little, I have a little Kickstarter uh, to sort of help, you know, we're selling some pre-order CDs and some t-shirts and stuff like that. Cool. And that's about 75% funded. So, uh, you know, I, I think it seems like everything's going on track, you know, okay. fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah. What's kind of the the hope with this record? You want to take this band on the road? You want to kind of just make a name for yourself as a solo artist and then just follow it up with another record? I mean, I definitely, my next record, whenever I, I make it, will be all original music. So that, that mm -hmm. will be, you know, the, the next uh, step in sort of my recording career. Um, I definitely want to perform with this band. I think that we have, you know, like a, a certain kind of, niche where we can you know like we're doing a, a concert at uh birdland uh oh, in cool. later this year and you know we've uh advertised it as marty eisenberg's wes anderson playlist so there's a very i i i want to keep doing this project but i also want it to sort of morph into like a little bit more of an original music project with some of these um arrangements in the repertoire um but yeah, you know, the goal is to is to create space in my life to be able to like play at some venues that I don't have to ask all my friends and family to show up for <laughs> some of the like, you know, more well-known jazz establishments where I, we can, you know, promote, but show up and play and sure. have some consistent growth with a band. Right. Right. Are, are venues over there as uh, fussy as they're I fussy. imagine them to be? Like, I know they're fussy out here and I... I can only imagine with <laughs> even more of a jazz scene over there that it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there are there are the venues that have built in audiences that you don't sure. have to worry about. And that's where everybody wants to play. And then there are the sort of next tier venues where they are jazz centric. You know, like people know that, <laughs> that, that jazz happens there, but you still have to kind of bring your own audience and then I guess there's, you know, everything else. But those yeah. are those are the places you need to navigate. Cool. Um, what are there? Do you got some ideas rattling around for the next? Honestly, no, not no? yet. Okay. I, you know, I'm I'm writing songs, I'm writing some tunes and stuff, but I, I don't I don't know if it will be a fully conceptual album again. Or I I know that you know when I, I love albums and i want yeah. every album i make to tell a story i i feel like if if my album is just sort of like a grouping of tunes it, it's just it, it it's it's not going to have the same uh it's not going to be gripping to an audience in the same way mm -hmm. as if i'm able to tell some sort of story through the music sure. so i don't have an over overarching 
concept yet, but okay. uh, you know, I'm 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 you know I'm I'm working on it. Yeah, I mean, you're still really spending a lot of emotional time and energy. Yes, yeah, I'm definitely doing this phase fully of this one. In this album. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's probably a good thing, you know. <laughs> Instead of just yeah. like, all right, on to the next one, and then no one, you know, hears this or knows about this one or right. Yeah, um, and honestly, that's what a lot of musicians do, and it's it's yeah. sort of uh, I I want to tell them like. Get your album out. It's so good, you know, like, but it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. It is tough. And I mean, I think, like, I kind of get it from both sides because I just enjoyed the creative process. I think seeing yeah. it finally get across the finish line was enough for me. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's yeah. like in the back of my mind, I'm like, that. Yeah, no one's going to. It's fine. Like, who cares? Maybe they'll listen to it. Maybe they'll like it. I don't give a shit. It's not like I'm going to retire <laughs> off that record. So, like, yeah. whatever. You know, just on yeah. to. I'd rather just be a part of the creative process. And then instead of yeah. trying to to squeeze pennies out of this thing and probably investing more money than I'll make back on it. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a totally like healthy and and like you know. I don't know if it's healthy or noble way of thinking about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know, man. I mean, it seems like you know to, to to have that much love for the creative process that you are not you know it, it's not the end goal that people love you is kind of uh you know a healthy yeah, no, or at least a cool way to approach it. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I don't. I don't need. It's not necessarily about the attention. It's just about the creative. That, like that was that was that was. <laughs> <laughs> How are you on stage then? Are you really good at like uh, when you when you're leading a I band? Am, yeah, <laughs> are you really comfortable there? I'm not comfortable. I'm comfortable on stage. But as soon as I have to like engage a crowd, for some reason yeah. I act like I don't know how to talk or or anything, which is hilarious because doing this I. I'm talking right, to you're people a professional I'm, talker. Yeah, yeah, and I'm talking to people I've never met before. But sure. if I'm on a stage, I can't... I have to think about it. Like, dude, just think about it like you're doing a podcast. Just think about it like you're doing yeah. a podcast. And like, kind of psych myself out. Yeah. But you're, you're good. No, you're I, good I love it. I, lo yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I'm how good I am at it, but I, I, I love it. <laughs> as you long know? as you love I it, love cool. <laughs> talking to the audience and trying to, I, trying to tell jokes. I think, you know... If if I were if I were even crazier than I am, I would have wanted to be a comedian, you know. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Actually, yeah. I think that I think ultimately that is my dream job, and somehow I yeah. just ended up as a bass player. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But like, the more I get into comedy, the more I'm just like, man, that's insane. Oh, it's brutal. It's so brutal. Uh, one person, like, you're like, so one exposed. person. I know controlling a whole room, a whole theater, and like, there's no, there's no bullshit. They're not fake laughing at you. They just don't laugh. Yeah. You yeah. know, like people can yeah. fake applaud after a tune's yes, over. Yes, that's true. That's <laughs> but true. But they yeah, cannot fake point. laugh uh, yeah. as a group like that. It's yeah. It's so I'm assuming very unforgiving. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but me too. I I always think that'd be cool, and I've gotten really more into comedy, not personally, yeah. but just within the art of it. Yeah. I do think there's fascinating that we're talking about this. I think that there's a relationship between comedians and musicians somewhere in there. Dave Chappelle made some quote where like, what is it? Comedians can play an instrument and all musicians think they're funny. Like there was a kind of an angle yeah. where it was a dig on musicians and I got pissed. Yeah. I'm like, shut up, Chappelle, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> we're funnier because we don't write our jokes. All right. Yeah. You guys work the, you guys work this shit out. We're, yeah. we're we're just crushing this right off the top of our heads. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, like the life of a musician, you know, you're hanging out in a in a van with four other people and like all day long, you're just trying to make each other laugh, you know, like that's yeah. kind of the thing. But I mean, even like the lifestyle and the occupation, there's something very, uh, there's a well, lot yeah, of parallels I, to it. I think I can tell you what it is. We, we want attention. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody does, though. Do you think that's unique yes. to the, the artist? I don't think it's unique to the artist. I think, well, I mean, so that's sort of the interesting thing with the social media revolution is that it gives everyone sort of that access to attention that used to be only for people in the performing arts. I think that <clears throat> everybody wants attention. We all come, we're all born as babies and, and receive the love of our parents and sure. you know, or some of, some of us don't, which makes you want attention even more, I, I understand, you know. So there is something about... Um, I think there is something about people that go into the performing arts 
that is craving attention, you know? I and think and so. everybody does, but I think it's especially especially us. I do think that um, people that go into performing arts are trying to reconcile something. That too. Yeah. Whether it's sure. like specifically attention or maybe it was trying to reconcile the, the lack of attention they got and they're trying to find mm-hmm. their place in the world. I do think that pretty much we're all trying to reconcile something. Yeah, and we, yeah, no, you I know, agree. I absolutely we get into that. this thing before we even know what we're trying to reconcile or how to mm-hmm. talk about it. Yep. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating sociological thing yeah. to be a part of because I know I just go down these rabbit holes where I'm constantly investigating my own brain and why the hell I'm doing any of this. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I love being creative and like I mentioned, the creative process. But more often than not, I hate the occupation of being a musician. You know what I mean? Yes. Like sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I-, I love playing music. I love playing the bass. I love all that. But the, the nature of like what gigs pay and you get to do your own taxes and the mm-hmm. the occupation of it sucks. It's just the 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 constant energy level of it. You know, it's it, it's it's it can be exhausting. You know, oh my it's like. Gosh constantly moving around like trying to keep up you know like even when you're inspired by other people you're sort of like oh shit i gotta practice more so i can be more like them you know and then it's like when the hell am i gonna do that you know yeah i know i know in addition to in addition to being around and working with people that are all sorting out their own head too Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and you're like you're around all these super interesting personality types uh they can be draining it's uh it's a lot. I don't. It's funny. Like I wonder why I do this, but then at the same time, this is still the, the only thing I want to be doing. Yeah. You know, it's it's fascinating. The whole yeah. nature of people that get into this is fascinating. Yeah. It uh, is. It is. Who are some of those people that inspire you? Uh, besides Wes Anderson, obviously. Like musicians. Uh, musicians, maybe specifically bass players or other composers. Mm-hmm. Sure. You, you mentioned uh, Gary McFarland, but who are some others? Some of my favorite bass players are uh, Larry Grenadier, Mm -hmm. Charlie Hayden. I mean, I like a bass player who is virtuosic, but kind of, it's not about that. Their playing isn't about how much they can do on the instrument. It's a little bit more what they can do with the instrument and finding their individuality through being really precise with what they're trying to say. And I, mm. I feel like Larry Grenadier is the best at yeah. that. You know, he's so um, that is fascinating. That is a bass player's bass player. He's like yes. the, the double bass equivalent of like Pino Palladino. Like he's just yes. a bass player's bass player. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, I love Pino Palladino. Yeah, Pino. Um, I like some of, you know, some of the big large ensemble composers like Bob Brookmeyer, Marie Schneider, um, Darcy James R.K. Um, I love Charles Mingus. I mean, his, his music, it's just so like, you can't write down his music. That's what's mm-hmm. so amazing about it. It's just like it, it, somehow he, he, it's all created in a way that, uh, it, it's dependent on the, these musicians that are in his orbit. Right. And and it's just like so deep, uh, Sun Ra, mm. you know, anything that sort of is is weird and and um, and interesting to me. I have other influences too, like Radiohead is, is a sure. band that I love. Uh, I love what Wolfpack is doing. I think it's, okay. it's super cool vibe. Yeah, those are a few of my a few of my yeah. cats. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a couple like. Some common denominators are these groups and musicians that are kind of left of center. Did you get into a lot yeah. of like singer songwriters like Elliot Smith, Damien Rice? Yes. People like that that are kind of like, you know, the old 97s. Like they're, they're there, but they're always off to the side. Kind of. Yeah. And I think they choose to stay there. Yeah. Like so many yeah, yeah, of yeah. those. Uh, I mean, Elliot has passed, but uh, so many of them have successful careers and never really, you know, Dr. John Dude, that was one of her, those, yeah. one of those yeah. artists. Like you just always purposely stayed on the side. Yeah. Is that something yeah. you, uh, 
are kind of can identify with or are attracted to Absolutely. in a sense because it Absolutely. maybe gives it makes it more unique if it's not part of the machine yeah and it, it's 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 personal and it's 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 uncompromising in its vision and it's not for the sort of normal consumer it's it's not made for everyone and i, mm -hmm. I think that you know there are, there are I think that there is something fascinating about like artists who are able to sort of capture that sort of zeitgeist and and create something that everyone is into. But like those artists are never really the people that speak as much to me because I want something a little bit more unique and a little mm -hmm. bit more um, unexplored. You know, I want to be surprised when I'm listening to music. Sure. I want to be taken on a journey. Sure. The the problem with that after you've listened to so much music and performed so much music is it's hard to feel that. Yeah, and you've you've and I think most performers already have let's say at least 95% more you've experienced more with irregular concepts or music whatever. You've taken more turns than the average person. So what you're looking for, how do I say it? Having the listener take the turn that still inspires you without losing them is a challenge. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about that. Because, you know, they could easily be lost. And meanwhile, you're over here like, you, yeah, I've already been down that road. I know where it leads, you know, like whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but creating this brand new territory over here that's still inspiring to, you know, someone who's well-traveled to keep the analogy yeah. going. That's that's not necessarily the terrain for the uh, the novice hiker. Yeah. And now I'm I done with the there's... outdoors analogies. <laughs> I ran my shit into the ground. I think that there's something, and this is um, something I've talked about a lot with um, Ray Anderson, who is a trombone player, who is uh, my advisor at, at Stony Brook. And he has had the most, like, weird career like he he's been like an avant-garde trombonist over you know his entire career doing really weird stuff and he's a total free spirit amazing guy um but something we've talked about a lot is sort of no matter what you're doing no matter how far out it is or um how sophisticated how complicated it is because a lot of modern jazz is like super complicated you know um, there needs to be this aspect to the music that you're making that connects to a, a universal human experience, you know, something that um, you can relate to, even if you don't know what the hell is going on, you know, because if, if you lose, if your music loses that, then it becomes a little, you know, academic or like not as meaningful. So even when you're making these turns that are surprising, there needs to be this sense of telling a human story, you know, and that's, you know, something that I, I try to keep in my concept. That I agree. I agree. <clears throat> um, on topic of telling a human experience in this culture that is so driven by the rise of AI one, mm. um, <clears throat> Social media, which is just everybody's highlight reel, that's not a human connection at all. That's who they right. want, they who they wish they were every day, basically. Mm -hmm. Or their uh, brand. Yeah, exactly, whatever it is. So that's in normal society, we're dealing with daily the decline of a human experience. Mm -hmm. So combating that with music or through music, like really touching the human experience. Um, yeah. What are some other ways you're like within the the longevity of your career that you're, you know, things to continue to pursue that? Because mm -hmm. next year at this time, who knows where we'll be? You know, Sarah Connor's yeah. carving no fate into a picnic table <laughs> and they're coming. They're coming. They're coming for us. I'm glad you got that. Reference. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that's a, that's a, a very good question. Um and I think it's something that, you know, all musicians have to think about in their career. You know, you have to have this sort of multi-pronged, especially as acoustic instru instrumentalists or jazz musicians, whatever it is, this multi-pronged approach to um, what you're bringing to the world. It's not just about 
the music that you're making, there's a level of sort of creating audience awareness about the importance of music. And that's, I consider sort of advocacy in some ways. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, education. We, ha you know, there's, there's training the next generation of, of musicians and, you know, you do that by just sharing what you love, you know? Yeah. 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 All right. Curious. Uh, cool, man. Yeah. Thanks again for being on and, uh, yeah, man. anything, anything new comes up, let me know. I appreciate that, man. I'm going to, I'm going to follow your stuff. I, 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 this was really fun. All right, all right, all right. That was my talk with Marty Eisenberg. Again, his album is titled The Way I Feel Inside. Highly recommend it, checking it out. Highly recommend checking it out. It's it's on all the things. It's on all the platforms. You can stop by his website, MartyEisenberg.com. I have links up to all of that at TheBayShed.com backslash podcast backslash Marty Eisenberg. Uh, that's about all I got for this one, folks. That's about all I got for this one. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy the show, please hit subscribe wherever you are listening to it. Please give it a rating. Give it a thumbs up. Give it whatever engagement thing there is. You know, if it's a heart, if it's a thumbs up, is it a whatever, whatever. I'm not even, you know, I don't even know. Whatever. Okay, so I got to talk about this, right? So Meta has this new one out. It has this new one called Threads. I don't even know why. I saw this thing on Instagram and I clicked on it, just a series of numbers, and then all of a sudden I'm signed up for it, and it's like the new the new Twitter, or they're trying to compete with Twitter or something. I don't know. Uh, just why can't the two billionaires just like stay in your own lane, huh? Just Elon can keep Twitter and Tesla, and then Zuckerberg, you have Instagram and Facebook and whatever else you're doing. Just stay in your own lane, huh? Stay in your own lane, everybody. Ah, whatever. That was, I, don't know, I don't even know what I'm ranting about there. I don't even know what I'm ranting about. Uh, that's all I got for this one. I will catch you on the next one in a minute. <laughs>